Audio Drama Production Podcast, Episode 27. How to Structure Your Story. The Audio Drama Production Podcast. Hello again, welcome to episode 27 of the Audio Drama Production Podcast. As always, we'll point you towards the Facebook group. Afterwards, you can go and have a look, see what we're talking about on there. That's Audio Drama Production Podcast, obviously. There's also the website, audiodramaproduction.com, our spiritual home, if you like. My name's Robert, and I'm with my colleague Matthew, as always. Good day, sir. Uh, yes. Before we start, I'm glad you brought up the Facebook group. I just had a very brief, well, notice to put out, a pub- public service notice, Uh Basically, I've got a very, very bad phone. It's one level below the Nokia 3310. And um, oh what, what's been happening is we've got the Facebook group, uh, which is really good and really active and a lot of fantastic people in there. And I would encourage you to join it. But for some of you that have probably tried to join it, you, you've maybe found that you haven't been approved and it's still pending. And that's actually because I've got such a bad phone. And I only noticed this the other day. When you get the notification that someone wants to join, and like Mm -hmm. I get a notification and I'll click on it, nothing happens. I'll click on it again, nothing happens. And then suddenly, like it goes 10 pages forward. And I noticed the other day someone tried to join and I clicked and clicked and clicked. And then suddenly it comes up request successfully ignored. So I've just realized I've probably turned away like 30 people. (laughs) And, uh, oh dear! So I sincerely apologise to everyone who that's happened to. I I, I couldn't put a number on it because this is the first time I've noticed it. So, in theory, it could be the first time, but I don't think it is. Is that possible then that by the time I've seen the request and I've clicked on it and I can see that the request is no longer there, and I'm thinking you've already approved them? Does that mean you you might have actually knocked them back by mistake? Well, this is the problem with the Facebook requests: is that once you reject one, it will. You know, it might be there uh, the next time you're on, but it'll just vanish after that. It won't be in your past requests or your past notifications. It just vanishes. So I've no way of getting in touch with the people and saying to them, look, could you could you rejoin? But fortunately, we have a podcast and hopefully most of them listen to it. So uh, if you have tried to join the group and you're still not in the group, that's why I sincerely apologise and just click... Uh, join again and this time I'll let Robert accept because I think Robert you at least have a phone that works. As we speak I certainly do yes where is the damn thing actually never mind I'll find it I just hope it's on silent. That that clears all of that up I hope um, and we can get on to, to more interesting matters. Yes talking to the Facebook group someone that's in there Kessie our listener in Germany she had a, a question, didn't she, that we thought we would actually uh, bring to the podcast itself. So do you want to read it? Do you want me to read it? Um, you go for it. You're uh, you're a bit more astute in the old reading and speaking <laughs> front. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So she asks, can you guys talk about your way of working sometime? I mean, with the Dropbox and all, and what Kess is referring to there is that Matthew and I use Dropbox, a file sharing system, so that we can both put files into a cloud basically uh, and then go into them as we see fit and and we work that way. Uh, She goes on to say, I get that most of the people in the group are probably doing their stuff on their own but I'm pretty impressed by how you coordinate your work on Aftermath, our audio drama, with two people, me and you, working on the same files and the same sound effects pool. How the hell do you keep organised? We don't. (laughs) Yeah. I would say it's a living, breathing, organic system that has changed quite a bit since the early days, I suppose. It is topical because I know know there's a a second part to this, but I'll just cut in. Mm -hmm. It is is topical because we're working on the very last episode of Aftermath right now. I think we've put in a good 10-hour shift today between us. Easily, yeah. And, you know, I think we're maybe... I think the way we're working this episode, because we do chop and change it, uh, and try new things. I think this is by far the best way uh, is the way we're doing it now. And it was an idea you came up with, Robert, wasn't it? To to put all the sound effects in one folder mm-hmm. in the production. Because before we'd maybe have uh, 
the, the scene folders with each of their sound effects in and it was causing a bit of problems. Adobe Edition was asking us to manually find certain things and it was it was getting a bit of a headache because I'd go on and do a bit, I'd go out, Robert would go on to his computer and do a wee bit and you seem to always be on the phone to each other trying to describe where these sounds might be and it's uh, it's easily avoidable as we've found out now. Yeah, I mean before we would maybe put the sound effect in for scene one, put them all into the folder for scene one and that's fine but then you'll maybe use that same sound effect like the same car door from before in a, a later scene. So do you make a copy and then you're doubling up on the the, the amount of um, memory you're using, uh, especially on a cloud, which is limited. I think I've got like an 8 gig account for Dropbox. Or do you then just try and remember that you kept it in scene 1, even though it's for scene 4 now, uh, and then like your computer would know that, but I'd go on and I'd load it and, and it's saying... Well, where is it? Because it's not in this folder. Because my Adobe doesn't know it's in scene one's folder. So you would then have to tell me, oh, I think it's here or I think it's there. So, yeah, it seemed better that the best thing to do is we have the episode folder, lots of little folders inside that for each scene, and one extra folder that's just for sound effects and music and stuff. And also constantly backing things up on our on our own independent uh, desktops as well because you, you can never have too much backup uh, and I also started I think it was the last episode I put it in there we started using the spreadsheet yes and basically that that's just to, to sort of help us know where exactly we are so you've got your in your spreadsheet you've got your scenes uh, there's a, a category a column for is it outdoor or is it indoor uh, is it maybe in a car What's your ambient tracks, so wind, rain, etc. Um, what sort of sound effects might you need? Because then we dive into the sound library and try and compile all the sounds that we're going to need for the production as well. And you can scroll down the, the spreadsheet. You see whose voices are in, whose voices are still to come in, what ones we've cleaned up and processed, uh, what voices we've mixed down, voice cuts and things like that. So... It gives you a very, at a glance, in theory, somebody who's never worked on Aftermath or with us should be able to open up that spreadsheet and and take it from there. Yeah, and importantly as well, a lot of the time we'll get voices in and there'll maybe be a couple of lines missing. I think just about everyone that's ever worked on us with Aftermath uh, has missed out a couple of lines at some point over the two series. Uh, And it happens, and... I think we've done it ourselves. And then also there'll be a few lines where we want them to do a retake and do it slightly differently. The spreadsheet is great for keeping a track of all these things. Like at the moment we know of, I think we've we've got two actors that are still to send us retakes or missing lines. And there's 12 scenes in an epilogue for this episode. So, you know, where do those lines go? What was it for again? Oh, yeah. Easy to keep a track of it. So, yeah, the more complex your work gets, I think, the more you probably should rely on a spreadsheet to keep you right, especially if you're working with somebody else like Matthew and I are. And I think, you know, I I, I maybe wouldn't recommend working the way we do, but it's just the way we've always done it, and that's why we're fine with it. Yeah. Um, I, I could imagine it being a nightmare for people who are established producers. I don't think, I don't think most producers would be interested in sharing their multi-track with anyone else. Um, and, you know... I suppose from our point of view, it's good because I was quite lazy when I when I started editing uh, back in, well, it was three or four years ago when I edited my first bit of audio. And I used to have some ridiculous methods. Hmm. And uh, right down to naming files and things like that, I'd have multi-tracks. And I remember I had this, I can't remember what it was, I had a, quite a useful couple of sound effects in, a, in an MP3 form, and it was called Thingy. <laughs> and uh, I always had a, a a multi-track with the thingy file in it, and I thought, like, if if someone ever had to take over from me, they'd be thinking, like, what's thingy? But, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for naming things what they actually are, rather than just nonsense. That uh, wasn't bar noises, was it, when you were walking around on a wooden floor and pouring drinks into glasses? Could have been. Could have been that. It could have been any number of things, but... Right. Uh, Naming files and things as well. I mean, that's that's probably subject for another discussion, but it's always handy to 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 clarify on your sound effects and things like that exactly what they are and exactly where they're, they're supposed to go in terms of the scenes. Yeah. 
uh, I wouldn't go as far as the the timing in the scene, but you know, some might. So yeah, I mean, I, I would say we definitely are a lot closer to the official way of working, like you would maybe find at the BBC, with lots of different forms to fill out. You know, like a list of sound effects and exactly how long for and and when they come in in the duration. Now, that's that sort of thing. Uh, we're not quite as uh, pinned down as that. I don't think we need to be, but it shows that we're you know we've we've grown as producers for sure because we were kind of lazy and finding our way and then you know every time we find a different way that's better then we we adopt it I think when that's the important thing but yeah there's the second part of the email shall I read that out as well because there's something quite useful oh yeah yeah do that how do you distribute who does which scene though do you split up work from script, a.k.a. you say scene one, Rob, scene two, Matthew, scene three, Rob, etc.? Or do you go by who has the most inspiration for a certain scene and call dibs? I think in some instances, especially if it's a scene that maybe one of us wrote it almost entirely on their own, they'll maybe want to produce it, do the majority of the, produ- the production, the producing. <laughs> because, you know, they, they, they've got the image in their head uh like she says who has the most inspiration but i don't think that happens very often because you and i have worked so closely on the writing for each scene that most of the time it's fine either one of us can go in and and work on it yeah um i i would say it would it would seem to me now that one of us will almost entirely build the scene in terms of sound effects and music and then the other person will come in and have a look and see and maybe make some recommendation or a couple of tweaks. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. The fin- yeah, the final build is usually by one of us and then, you know, uh, the other one will act as consultant, I guess. But we both know what we're doing because we're both building the same thing. We, we have the same vision. Yeah, I, th- I think we, we we know what we're looking for in terms of how it should sound. And, uh, and it's always good to have the second pair of years because you work on a scene and and you, you can be very happy with it, but then it helps just to get that, because you, you've listened to it probably 20 times during that editing process, and that's just a small scene, and uh, yeah, you do become a bit desensitised to it, and what, what I actually often do, and this isn't directly relevant to Kessie's question, but I like to step away from the, the multi-track, because I think it becomes too visual, you're actually looking at the waveforms, you're looking at the enveloping, the panning, and that can that can affect what you hear, I think, because it's a visual thing. Yeah. And you've got to understand that the, the audience don't have that. So a lot of the times I'll mix it down, shove it on my iPod, and just go for a walk, uh, and then just completely use my ears to pick out what maybe doesn't sound right and what maybe doesn't... Yeah. Uh, or what, what could be improved on, so... It's definitely a, a tip that I would recommend to people if they don't already do it. Like, say, you've got an ambient track of uh, water, for instance, washing up on a harbour, um, and it's a quite a loud track, but you've you've lowered the level in the multi-track of the volume right down to minus 90%, and you might think, well, that's going to be really quiet, but if you actually close your eyes, if it was a tremendously loud track to begin with, it might still drown out the speech and you might have to lower it just a little bit more or you know driving the car you might think you've lowered it quite a lot and you've told yourself you've taken the volume down by 70 percent so therefore it it must be quiet enough but is it you know close your eyes don't trust them yeah always trust your ears first and foremost more than anything you see on the screen and i mean how many times i've uh, become desensitized to a scene and i've stepped away from the computer and listened to it and i've heard that maybe there's been a, a tiny gap between the ambient tracks that were running underneath. You know, maybe you've got a wind file that doesn't stretch to the full extent of the the uh, speech. Right. And instead of maybe fading in and fading out, there's been a small gap or they've just been touching, so there's a small pop. Or maybe one of them's just ended. And it won't be till you're away from the computer and just listening in a dark room or out on a walk. And it, it's so obvious to you and you can go back and fix it. Uh, and, you know, that's something as well as before you put your show out there, listen to it as many times as you can until you're practically sick of it and listen to it on as many different things as you can as well. Listen to it on your phone and earbuds, on headphones, even out the laptop speakers because uh, 
even though you totally wouldn't recommend it, I suppose there's there's always going to be someone who who listens that way. Yeah, it's amazing when you do put the headphones back on just how much bassier it is compared to the laptop. For instance, you know, you've got to be aware of the the higher frequencies and the lower frequencies that one device might not be able to to convey and then you listen to it in a different format and it does convey it and you think, wow, that's really deep and bassy. So, yeah, listen to it as many different ways as possible because otherwise you might miss something that the listener won't and they might hear something you don't want them to hear. So that's a wee bit of, uh, wee bit of production and we were, uh, we were actually going to talk about writing in this episode but that's a, a wee bit of bonus content there. <laughs> Um, just the writing episode, but here's some production tips. <laughs> it's it's just I mean some things that have came up in the Facebook group and even just when we're we're talking about it ourselves, uh, various things to do with writing. And we had a wee chat today, Robert, briefly on the phone about uh, story acts and how they might be relevant or how they they might not be relevant in audio drama. Um, yeah, and we thought it would be a, a good thing to to bring up on the podcast. So the, the 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 concept of the story act, and you might already know this yourself, but it's a uh, usually a three act structure, and uh, a lot of Hollywood, uh, probably most all Hollywood films, follow this sort of uh, route, don't they, Robert? Yeah, I. I mean, it, even when you're in your first school. And you're getting taught how to write a story, and they they show you the fish, you know, it's got a tail and a body and a a face, and that's that's your story, your beginning, middle, and end, and that's acts one, two, and three, isn't it? So, I mean, before we before we get to what it actually is, is the is the three act structure, is it relevant only for something that's feature length? I mean, is it something you would put in an actual series? Surely, surely you're wanting more climaxes and more incidents. And also, if it's a one-off and it's smaller, it might be, you know, a 15-minute. Is it, is it fair to try and cram a three-act structure into something like that? I think, certainly, like, the, the different elements of a story that are applied to a series from the very beginning to the very end, um, story writers do have to break that down and apply the same structure to each episode. For instance, every episode of every drama series has to have a cliffhanger at the end of some sort, something that draws you to want to to check it out next week. And that that's a an absolute given. Uh, I would say the start is Act 1, as in setting it out, which we'll go into later. The middle, there's the drama, and in the end is the, the climax and the cliffhanger. I mean, that, that's, that applies to everything, every series and every episode of every series, I think. Yeah, the example I thought of and it's it's one of my favourite films is Terminator Two, and uh, I mean if you go through the the three act structure and that so Act One in any story if you're going for this structure, you have a a status quo, don't you? You have the the character, the protagonist's life as it exists before the film starts. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a sense of normality that doesn't necessarily mean they have a happy life. So in Terminator Two, you've got young John Connor. He's got his He's got his life, you know, he's got his friend with a ginger mullet mm-hmm. and uh, he's into credit card scams by the looks of things as well. Yep. Um, and at the end of your first act, the status quo is spoiled by the fact that a big liquid metal robot from the future wants to kill him and that's the, the end of your first act. That's your disaster, your inciting incident, isn't it? Yeah, that, that there is a bit of conflict there What with the, the, the homicidal humanoid thing that's coming to get him. So that that gives him cause to consider his uh, situation and take action. And of course, they they do say that your your character has to be committed to the goal of the story by the end of the first act. And he, there's always that bit of denial. Uh, obviously, he'd be he'd be right up for denying what he found out that he was actually involved in. Um, he even got the the Terminator to to batter a couple of guys, and that was. That was what won him over to the Terminator, wasn't it? Yeah, that and the, the stories from his mum as well, I guess. You know, the, the whole thing was real. Um, and it, it's funny, isn't it, that all these films with uh, aliens or ghosts or people from the future or a combination, they always have to c- try and convince the, the observer that they really 
don't believe it at first because you really wouldn't believe it. You really wouldn't. Yeah. But at the same time, you've got to get them to believe it so we can get on with the damn film. So it's always like, oh my God, really? No way, that can't be true. Oh well, I suppose it must be. Let's go. <laughs> Let's get on the bike and uh, get chased by the guy in the lorry. Yeah, we it wouldn't be much a story if the main character just constantly went, so let me get this straight, you know, he just kept bringing it up. And, yeah. And Arnie's, Arnie's basically peeled Ollie's skin off <laughs> to try and prove it, but nah, he's still not having and it. he's like, come on, what have I got to do here? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's probably the hard part for filmmakers or story writers is to convincingly have the character buy into it. And I guess for Terminator 2, the good thing for there was that he had the stories from his mum, so it wasn't just out of the blue. It was like, oh, right, I know about this. I mean, I don't believe it, and I'm still not sure. But, you know, it's it's at least got his foot in the door there. So if you look at Act 2, you, you end Act 1 with your, your big disaster. Uh, then, of course, they go and break his mum out of the institution that she's in. And, uh, but coming up to the end of Act 2, you've got your, your sort of second disaster, if you like, because... As they're going to flee the country into Mexico, she suddenly changes her mind and decides to go back and, and shoot Miles Dyson of Skynet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she decides to go for that. The quest suddenly becomes not just to get him away from the Terminator, but to chase Mum and stop her from doing that. And they do stop her. And uh, there's a, again, we'll come to this later, but a critical decision, which is to to actually destroy the technology rather than just killing the man who eventually goes on to fix the technology into leading to the end of the world. So it's a harder route, you know, breaking into a big building to to do that, to get the technology, when they could just shoot the man at home. It's a lot easier. There's a lot less security guards there. But that was the decision they made, was to take the harder route and going in there. And that leads us to Act 3. Yeah, the the smoke clears again. And, uh, you know, they move into the, uh, well, it's a big forgery, isn't it, that they're in? And, uh, of course, another setback when the Terminator himself appears to die, but, of course, comes back to life. Yeah. Uh, It's almost the false climax, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the all is lost moment. Definitely. And you're thinking, well, they can't. They can't win now, and of course they do, because Arnie always wins. And there's a, another false climax in that, you know, when they pour the liquid nitrogen on him and he f- completely freezes, then Arnie shoots him and he, he explodes. And, you know, I'm sure we all thought, yes, well, that's it, he's in pieces now and he's totally frozen, that's got to be it. You know, even a Nokia 3310, as you mentioned before, but it couldn't take that. Um, but it's a false climax because it's starting to warm up and gel together. We haven't got much time. So they head into the forge. Um, T-1000 gets his act together, chases them, kills Arnie, so we think. And, yeah, it's definitely all is lost because he's pinned Sarah Connor through the shoulder. Uh, he's got the wee knife finger thing yeah, going on. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I, I haven't seen it for years, but I'm, I'm fairly certain it's approaching her eye. And uh, does Big Arnie not appear from behind them? And I mean, I might be totally wrong. It's like I say, it's been years. I'm going to have to watch it now. No, you're right. Ah, he's got him pinned. I think it's with the right index finger through the left shoulder, uh, and then he uses his left hand to uh, put the finger near her eye, and he, he's telling her to shout out to John to come over because, you know, it's really John he's after, and he's uh, threatening to put the thing, finger through her, her eye, and then. Arnie is riding on the back of some, I don't know, like a steamroller or something, and he, he's got one bullet left, and it just so happens that he staggers back the T-1000 just to get a shot in the chest and goes into the the liquid metal, and that's that's bad times for him. All's well that ends well. Yeah. So that that is that is an example of a, a three-act structure, and like I say, interested to hear people's thoughts, and... You know, is this only something that you could uh, do if you're creating a feature length production? Uh, like you say, Robert, if you're doing a series, you're more looking at, you know, your your acts are basically your episodes, aren't they? And you're you're reaching a climax at the end of each episode. It wouldn't be much of a story if you started and just had a very gradual descent towards the end of the story with nothing too interesting happening in between. Do you remember? I know you remember the road. 
Yeah, yeah, it was the the bleakest film I've ever seen. <laughs> that didn't seem to have much of a structure, other than just a series of depressing encounters with different characters in in basically the rubbish tip of the world that was left after the end of the world. Yeah, and then it kind of ends, and then you think, right. I've just That's I've never that. never been so sad. Just not even upset. Just you know <laughs> I've got nothing, and uh, yeah, empty. It was bleak. So yeah, not every film is easily identifiable with the uh, with the three act structure. I'm sure you could pin it out that oh well you know there's this bit at the beginning, then the, then they go here and then they go there and that's it. And it's like well that's okay, yeah, that's three acts I suppose, but it's nothing like the description that we've just given for Terminator Two, which you can apply to most, certainly most action films. Do I want to go through my eight point arc thingy? Yeah, go for it. So what we could also discuss is uh, something I I wrote up in terms of story writing templates. Now, we, we've just discussed the three-act scenario. You know, you, you, that's the outline for your story for what exactly what you want to happen. You know, the the, um, the quest, like in The Lord of the Rings, to take the ring and destroy it. So that's the very basics of it. But, you know, you can break it down even further and this template should help you to start to colour in your outline, if you like. So we'll go through them um, just briefly and we'll talk them over and then we'll apply them to different things. I have to say, my disclaimer is, I didn't invent the following structure that's been around for a long time. There's lots of examples of it online, particularly on websites that offer resources for novel writing or screenplays. You know, uh, there's lots of websites. There's even Twitter accounts they all point to the same sort of thing. Uh, there probably was someone who wrote the template up very much like I'm about to describe it. Uh, I'm not infringing on anything deliberately. This is, I'm sure it's public domain. So, you mentioned, Matthew, the status quo or the stasis. That's uh, how things are at the very beginning of the story. Uh, it's basically what's normal for the characters, usually immediately before the, the real story, the quest, kicks in and shakes things up. Uh, like Terminator 2 you mentioned the stasis is John Connor's life he's a punk kid with foster parents and and, a uh, ginger mulleted friend (laughs) with a mullet yeah Uh, like Neo in the Matrix as well he thinks he's still in the real world and he's a computer programmer with a crap life Uh, he's got no social life Bilbo Baggins living peacefully in the Shire just before Gandalf turns up and that is the time to set out your your world, your setting in a nutshell. And also, it's also because you want to have a, a bit of a bang at the beginning to hook everybody in, your reader, your listener, your viewer. It's also a chance to have something happen that's exciting that maybe alludes to the quest later on. Like, have you seen Ghostbusters? You surely have. Yeah, the film. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, at the very beginning, the there's... um. There's a librarian in the New York Public Library, and the ghost suddenly jumps at her and gives her the biggest fright in the world. And then the the, the credits come in and the theme tune, you know. Yeah. So that that's before we've even really seen the Ghostbusters themselves, and they're not even Ghostbusters yet. They're still working for the university. But the point is that it's something exciting that gives you a a clue as to what's going on. And the status quo is that you know. You actually see the state school, but they they're at university, the the Ghostbusters. But then the trigger, the trigger, the story kicks in, like in the Matrix, Trinity and Co. They find Neo, they give him the blue pill, and they show him the real world. Gandalf knocks on Bilbo's door, or Cinderella's godmother turns up to tease her with, and I've written here with the promise of balls, as in the the ball at the palace. So <laughs> there, so trigger. Thoughts on that? What was the trigger again for Terminator 2? The trigger was probably the fact that uh, the guy went and killed John's parents, didn't he? The T-1000. Uh, very nearly killed him at the arcade as well. Yeah. Uh, up until then, he, he he had no idea anything was wrong. Yeah, pretty much. Just some cop looking for him, so you better split, as the mulleted ginger person more or less said. So, yeah, the trigger. That leads us on to... The the main body of the film, the quest. The trigger usually results in a quest or a goal being established. For instance, a loved one being taken hostage. 
and that triggers the quest to rescue them, like uh, Liam Neeson's Taken. Bilbo's quest was to go with the dwarves to defeat Smog and bring back... Is it Smog or Smog, or do you not care? I'm not sure. It's been a few years since I've seen that as well. Neo's quest was to rescue Morpheus and also defeat Agent Smith, and Cinderella's quest was to go to the ball. Similarly, an unpleasant trigger, like the Ghostbusters getting kicked out of the uni, can involve a quest to seize an opportunity... Uh, like us, they went into business for themselves as independent, and this is where it's not like us, paranormal investigators and eliminators. So that was their trigger. They got kicked out of the unit, so they thought, to hell with it, we'll go and do it for ourselves. A pleasant trigger, the Goonies, they found a treasure map and they thought, well, let's go on a, an adventure. And that can mean a quest for riches, again, a bit like Bilbo, actually. And then they're enjoying the journey, and of course they had the extra um, adage of having criminals chasing them and also needing money to pay for the house at the end. So And befriending sloth as well. Yeah, that was the that was the best part, obviously. So yeah, the quest is really what the, the crux of the story is, what they're looking to do, what you want to happen. In the middle of the story is the surprise. That should take up the most of the act two, I suppose. Lots of different surprises. It can be pleasant events, but usually we want drama and conflict, so obstacles, hurdles complications and trouble for the heroes like in Terminator 2 lots of different obstacles like uh, well they had to go and break his mum out of jail uh, uh, the hospital first then the mum runs off they've got to chase after her an extra complication but then they can't just kill Mr Dyson uh, Miles Dyson I forgot what his first name was there because uh, he's a family man another hurdle then they've got to break in you know so lots and lots and lots of hurdles keep it interesting don't just slowly walk towards the end you know the hurdles need to be unexpected but plausible at the same time you know so you need to find a balance don't be too random and don't be too predictable so ultimately you want your listener to think ah i should have seen that coming and we talked a little bit early about the false climax where the heroes think they've succeeded or the all is lost moment where everything turns to rubbish so um, you've already mentioned the false climax with they thought they'd managed to beat the the T one thousand by freezing him, and then the, the false the um the all is lost because we thought Arnie was dead. Have you seen the wedding crashes? I took a note here because we talked about. Yeah, it. believe it or not, I watched that in Cuba subtitled. Good, Lord. but uh, yeah, caught the caught the end of it anyway. So one night you, had a few beers. You know, <laughs> you know their quest was to crash weddings and to succeed with the ladies. And then yeah. you've got the, the all is lost moment when the girls find out exactly who they are because the rich snobs have managed to turn them against them. And it's like, oh, no. Uh, but, you know, but now, yeah, we were those guys, but now we actually love you. So we're not really bad guys, but now you found out we're bad guys. And it's the all is lost moment because they've been found out. So that leads us to usually every story, a critical choice where the hero needs to make a critical choice, a crucial decision, which directly affects the outcome of the story. Um, Sarah Connor and John Connor and Arnie T100, they decide, right, let's actually go and break into that big, huge, secure place uh, and actually try and destroy the technology. And that, that was a lot harder than simply putting a bullet into Miles Dyson. This is a chance to show the listener who your characters really are when the chips are down, you know, what do they do? Who are they? And remember, they have to make a choice, you know, because it can't just be random luck. It can't just be like, oh, Miles Dyson ran away, so he escaped, so we're going to go to the factory anyway. That's random. They had to make the choice not to kill him. Neo in The Matrix, he stopped running. He chose to turn around and face Smith one-to-one. Bilbo, in the recent Hobbit uh, third part of the trilogy, he handed the Arkenstone to the elves um, he stole it from the dwarves give to the elves to give them the ultimate bargaining chip and that avoided a war and as you know the Ghostbusters towards the end they made a conscious decision uh, despite knowing there was only a slim chance of survival to cross the streams in order to save the world so any other critical choices you can think of any film you like well you're, you're going to you're going to hate me for this but Star Wars never seen it before but I did read about their uh critical choice and was it not when uh, Indiana Jones let me guess let me guess let me guess right it is when he deliberately turns off his targeting computer 
or is it Han Solo when he decides he's going to come back and help? Yeah, that was I was going to say Indiana Jones comes back on his uh, lightsaber, which is the spaceships that they fly. Right. And uh, it's because Doctor Who's in the, the Death Star and they've got <laughs> to blow it up because Doctor Who's a baddie. Right. Okay. So, yeah, if, there's always that critical choice. And it can be bad as well. I can't quite think of any at the top of my head, but I know they do exist. Because uh, it, it, the critical choice means choosing between doing the right thing, which is more difficult, and doing the wrong thing, which is bad but easy. Uh, I'd actually made a note here about Star Wars, funnily enough, about Luke turning off his target and computer and he trusts in the Force. Uh, oh, there is a bad one. There is a bad one. Empire Strikes Back, the sequel to Star Wars, which I know you've seen. No, I know you haven't seen, but I'll talk about it anyway. In fact, I'll tell you, right? Um, Luke Skywalker is getting trained by Yoda. I know you've heard of Yoda. And he knows his friends are in trouble. And Yoda's warned him, do not leave without finishing your training because you won't be ready and you'll lose. And you'll just be a d- But Luke can't help it. He feels he's got to go. He's learned a lot. He's going to go and face Darth Vader. So he runs off to help his friends and Yoda's like, damn fool. And he did. He lost. He lost to Darth Vader. He didn't die, but he lost his hand. And his critical choice was doing the... He didn't do the more difficult thing, which would have been to stay and know that his friends are suffering. He made the wrong choice and he suffered as a result. And that affected the outcome of Empire Strikes Back. So there you go. That's a a critical choice that went wrong. So it's important, obviously, to have that critical choice because it, it really pivots the story and it stops it from just being okay, let's set out to do this thing, and then an hour and a half later, we've done it. The climax, the critical choices your heroes make, must lead to the highest peak of tension in the story. The approaching climax, and I've put here the sum of your hard work. Uh, For instance, the climax Empire Strikes Back was the fight between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, the first one they ever had, and Luke lost. And that was a result of him going too early to fight him. Neo died in his confrontation with Agent Smith, but was subsequently reborn as the One, now at the height of his powers and able to defeat Smith. And Bilbo averted war between the dwarves and the humans and the elves, and they combined their armies just at the last minute to defeat the orcs and the goblins who were coming down the hill. And, as you know from Ghostbusters, they closed the portal, thus saving the world. And that's it. The, the story is achieved, and there you go. And You'd think that would be the end of it in terms of the template. However, there is also the reversal Any idea what that would be? No, fill me in. The reversal should be the consequence of the critical choice and the climax. And it should really change the status of the characters and maybe even the world itself, uh, and especially your hero. Uh, For example, in a story, an abused wife might leave her husband with her head held high, having found her confidence. Uh, At the end of Back to the Future, the consequences, the reversal, are Marty's parents turn out to be happier and wealthier despite their son's accidental mendling with time. Following the destruction of the second Death Star in Return of the Jedi, the Empire was overthrown and the New Republic was installed. At the end of Terminator 2, the, the reversal was that... What was the reversal? It was that, that uh, they, they had a new future to look at. Yeah, well, they thought so, but it didn't, it yeah, didn't work thought, out that yeah. way because they wanted to make more films, so... yeah. Uh, more films, more money. It's like, oh yeah, it turns out they couldn't. But at the time, we were led to believe that the reversal was that that, that impending future that, that seemed to be unavoidable, they'd managed to avoid it. So they'd literally changed the future, albeit just slightly. So yeah, you want a reversal of some sort. There needs to be a big change by the end of the film. Something that's satisfying, I suppose. They haven't just achieved the quest and then gone back to their normal life. They're actually they've defeated the bullies that bothered them at the the start of the film or they get the girl or whatever. So I'll just give the the headings again. The status quo, the trigger, the quest, the surprise, the critical choice, the climax, and ultimately the reversal. There you go. Good stuff. Yeah. It's worth noticing for you and I, I think, that there's been times where we didn't really have those elements as much as we might have done per episode of Aftermath. And I think maybe if we'd been really boned up on this, we might have made more of an effort to do that. But instead, we just got the story out and things happened when they happened, you know. But 
well, that's that's just how it is. You know, it's our apprenticeship. I think. Yeah, I mean, we've we've no professional training and and anything really. Writing, production, you know, anything we do, it's it's pretty much self-taught. I'm sure a lot of the listeners are in the same position. Mm-hmm. It's all just about discussion, learning, reading. Uh, listening, watching, doing whatever you can, analysing things yeah. and uh, finding something that works for you and that's that's what we're trying to do all the time is improve and learn. What I'd like to do at some point is maybe have a, a discussion with you on a future episode, it doesn't have to be next week by all means, uh, but talk about character creation and what goes into creating a character because like for instance everybody's sick of the hero in a story being X-Force's semi-retired policeman who is still fitter than 99% of the people on the planet and therefore able to do superhuman stuff, you know, like Jason Statham or whatever. We're all sick of those those heroes that just seem invincible. So how do you write a convincing character? Like, for instance, you mentioned Indiana Jones earlier. He's so popular, I think, partly because the actor's quite charismatic, but also because he's quite flawed. He's got quite a few flaws and he's screwed up quite a lot and you know, he'd go to shoot his gun at someone and he didn't have the gun because he forgot it or he lost it or whatever. Or, you know, uh, falling down a set of stairs because his dad had tripped a, a switch with a chair that made the staircase appear out of nowhere and he fell down it. You know, little things like that, you know, like have have imperfect characters. But we'll go into that more in, in the future, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we should probably start getting wrapped up now because we've... Uh... We've ran on quite a lot, but I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, I hope the listener has too, and we've still got plenty of material that we jotted down for for future episodes as well. Yeah, yeah, we'll keep that. In the near future on the show, we actually have uh, Domine from Audio Epics, all the way in Belgium, Uh, Marielle at Wireless Theatre, Fiona, Fiona Thrailer, good friend at Cooperantum Audio, and Mr Jack Kincaid himself will be on the show very soon as well, so... Uh, some, Who's that? some great guests. Yeah, Jack Kincaid, he's uh, a young upstart, a young whippersnapper in the medium. Right. And uh, yeah, he's a big Aftermath fan, so yeah, yeah. He, he begged me to let him on the show. And, uh, He'll learn a lot from us, yeah. You know what we're like, we're, yeah, we're, we're good guys. Yeah, definitely. I said, stick with us, son, that's what I said. <laughs> uh, you'll, uh, you'll make something of yourself, maybe. A name riding on our coattails. Um, yeah, it'll be good to hear... Uh, well, I've I've heard the the interview because he sent the file to us, but and it'll be good to put it out and get some feedback actually, and see what other people think, and uh, see if our uh, normal uh, worshipping of Mister Kincaid is is uh, is deserved. It is. So yeah, um, is it Domine or is it? Do- I always thought it was Domian. I've seen his name a few times. Domin. Domin. Do, domain is the, the Belgian pronunciation. I, I think if it was in English, you would say domain. Well, if that's how he wants it, I suppose. Send his name. He can do what he wants with it. That's right, Robert. Yeah, which was uh, Germanic or Teutonic in origin. Have I talked to you this before? Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought so. I had a, suddenly had a flashback there. Yeah, don't go on about it. Is that it? Yeah, we've got the we've got the ebook out. We mention it every week, but but please buy it. <laughs> it's on Amazon. And smash words. I think last week I called it an audio book for some reason. Well, I say for some reason I'd had six pints. Oh, yeah, right. But, uh, yeah, the, the audio book's out. So uh, and I don't know if anyone ended up on Audible trying to find it, but uh, a fruitless quest that would have been. Excellent. Oh, well. Anyway, right. I guess we better uh, wrap it up. So um, the next episode is out at the usual time, which is probably Friday these days. Yeah, Friday is the day we've been. Although I don't, I don't know. I'm away, so it might be the Thursday, it might be the Saturday. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Right. Okay. Uh, we'll keep the sense of mystery. Right. Okay. Look out for us. We'll be back. I promise. Goodbye from me and goodbye from you. I suppose. Yep. Have a good one. All right. Take care. Speak soon. <laughs>